Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 2023 UC Davis Emerging Scholars Panel. My name is Dani C. Martinez, Associate Professor in the School of Education and Chair of the Graduate Group in Education. We welcome you all virtually to UC Davis as guests on Putwin Lands. We'd like to invite you all to please take a moment to check into our event by scanning the QR code on the screen. This is especially important for undergraduates um, who are joining us today. Thank you. We are excited to reconvene this exciting this speaker series today, which has been on pause for a few years. Our last Emerging Scholars panel happened on campus on, in 2019. We were, as always, ready to plan and convene our 2020 session um, when, like many other plan, many of our plans, they were canceled and put on hold due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But we are back, and we are back with an amazing set of scholars ready to share their work with us all. I want to share with you a bit about how this started. Our first Emerging Scholars um, panel it was held on the UC Davis campus in 2016. Prior to that, Drs. Marcela Cuellar and Dr. Alexis Patterson and I were assistant professors in the School of Education with the idea of creating a speaker series that was different from another one we had back then in the School of Education. Um, that series featured prominent senior faculty from around the country. And we imagined a, an emerging scholars panel that would feature newer scholars in education. Um, as assistant professors ourselves, we knew there were new voices in the field of education that we believe needed to be heard. So as a young assistant professors, we nervously pitched our vision for what would become what we have here today, the UC Davis School of Education Emerging Scholars Panel. We spoke to then Dean Harold Levine. We told him about our plans to invite scholars at the postdoctoral to assistant professor stages of careers of their careers. Scholars who were already at the forefront of equity and justice in their work, scholars who were asking urgent questions of our fields in education, and scholars who at this junior careers, um, junior level of their careers were already influencing our fields. As we imagined this panel, we also knew it would be important to feature, uh, and an important feature of this panel was that it would be organized by assistant professors who would continue to shape the vision and goals for the panel as, um, as we had more and more assistant professors come to the School of Education. And as we um, became promoted to, to, to associate and beyond, we just knew that it was something that if it continued, it would rely on the, on the vision of newer assistant professors. Our dream, as y'all can see, was supported by then Dean Harold Levine, and we convert, convened our first Emerging Scholars panel again in 2016. We continued these panels with the support of our former interim dean, um, Dr. Paul Hastings, and now um, to, uh, with the, the, the support of our current dean, Lauren Lidstrom. This vision continues to be supported and elevated not only at UC Davis, but across the US as scholars who have participated in this panel feel connected to UC Davis. And we continue to hear from folks who are interested in knowing who will be our next featured guests. So the continued support has helped us sustain not only scholars across the country, but our own faculty here in the School of Education. So with this, I would like to introduce um, our own Dean in the School of Education who has been supportive of this um, panel for since she, she came here to the School of Education. Um, Dr. Lauren Lindstrom, will, who will share a few words with you all now. Thank you so much, Danny, and thanks to all of you who've joined us. It looks like we have a great audience here. Um, I want to start by just acknowledging these emerging scholars who are with us today. They came from all over the country, uh, converged here at UC Davis, and um, they're amazing. I'll just say that very briefly. They're amazing. I had a very brief chance to meet with them this morning. They're passionate. Um, they have cutting edge work, as Danny said, and they're ready to share with you um, the, their current thinking. I also want to acknowledge the faculty sponsors who put this together. It has been sort of a tradition at our school that this is sponsored by assistant professors. And in just in my short time here, I've seen many of those assistant professors move on to tenure and to other leadership roles. But let me just mention the four or five folks who've been involved in, in organizing this year's panel. Ilnil Blanco, Alicia Rusoja, Alexis Patterson-Williams, Fahima Mustafa, and I know Darnell Degan had a hand in there as well. So thank you for taking the time and energy in a really busy year uh, to put this together. I'll just end by saying this is one of those moments where I'm really proud to be the Dean of Education here at UC Davis. 
This particular panel aligns perfectly with our mission, which is to confront and eliminate inequities in education. So we're really thinking about that and thinking about opportunities for justice. At the same time, we're in this huge research institution and part of our strategic plan actually says we conduct research that matters. And so you're gonna really see examples of how equity and research intersect and become a really powerful tool for changing systems, for changing policy, for improving opportunities for all students. So thank you again for being with us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Alexis Patterson-Williams, who is also our incoming Chair of Teacher Education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Lindstrom, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Manali Sheth. Manali is assistant, an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Policy Studies in the College of Education at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Sheth obtained her BA in Biological Sciences and Neurobiology from Northwestern University and a master's in education from Northwestern School of Education and Social Policy. Dr. Sheth taught high school biology for six years in Chicago public schools. Uh, and then she went on and earned her PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Sheth's focus uh, and her research is on disrupting educational injustices experienced by multiply marginalized students of color in their capacities as knowers and learners. Working from a critical race and intersectional feminist pedagogy lens, she examines how academic conditions exacerbate educational inequities, as well as how transformative pedagogies can cultivate justice-oriented praxis across disciplines. Her current and future research projects illuminate how relationships of power, knowledge, and practice shape and can be shifted through pedagogy, curriculum, and policy for students of color whose experiences, interests, and needs are often marginalized in equity and justice initiatives across secondary and post-secondary academic settings. I met Manali eight years ago at a science education conference in Baltimore, Maryland. And through the years, I have been in awe of Manali's fierce and unwavering commitment to speaking truth to power. She doesn't just study the relationship between knowledge and power within education, but she is an active disruptor and what I like to believe a voice in the wilderness, impl imploring those with power to align with and center justice. And I cannot wait to hear more about the work she's sharing with us this evening. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Manali Sheth. Thank you, Alexis. And thank you to the committee for being wonderful hosts um, and to UC Davis for having us. Um, uh, So today I'm going to be presenting um, on some research and specifically a paper titled Schools Alive Toward a Critical Race Intersectional Pedagogy for Youth Policy Partnerships. Um, nope, I'm sorry. The controls are not working. Okay, um, so as Alexis briefly said, my research uh, focuses broadly on this question of how are students and educators of color epistemically excluded uh, in academic spaces and how do we push back through policy and pract practice. Uh, I kind of center and work at the intersection of these three areas, so disciplinary practices, whether that's science ed, policy analysis, or teacher education, um, looking at the learning conditions for students of color who live and learn at multiple subordinations and who are often invisible or sacrificed in mainstream 
academic spaces as well as social justice academic spaces. Uh, and I use critical theories of race and intersectional feminisms to um, understand how inequities are perpetuated and how we can push back on these specifically in terms of uh, the knowledges from communities of color and students and educators of color as knowers and knowledge producers. Um, so for this particular study, uh, we have been invited by a uh, urban district, school district in the Midwest um, to develop a youth policy partnership. Uh, the district had come under increased public scrutiny around inequities that students of color were facing in the district. And they wanted to engage with youth voice to inform um, the district's improvement agenda for equity. Uh, so we created Youth Voice Initiative, uh, which entailed, we asked them to make it a course as well as uh, monthly student advisory meetings where the students met with the district leadership. Um, and the course was designed by us to be a social justice education course. Um, even though the district wanted uh, kind of one of each kind of student to, rep to be represented in the uh, youth voice course and the student advisory board, um, we pushed for uh, the, the whole initiative to be informed mainly and only by student of color voices, youth of color voices, and specifically those who um, are multiply marginalized uh, thinking that these students um, were in the best position to speak to policy issues in the district. Um, we knew that there were barriers to, to engaging transformative youth voice partnerships um, from the literature. And then we noticed them playing out very specifically in our context. For example, um, we know that neoliberal equity policies reduce wicked, big social problems, uh, historical problems, such as racial oppression, gender oppression, um, to simplistic outcomes such as achievement and attendance. If we can just improve the attendance of this group of students, then we'll have equity, you know, we'll have equitable education. Um, we also know that single access equity work makes one group the problem in need of fixing oftentimes and render other experiences of oppression and marginalization invisible. Uh, and we know that oftentimes adults in general, but specifically district leaders, school leaders, oftentimes dismiss students of color as capable knowledge producers, educational leaders, and stakeholders in school improvement initiatives. So adults who don't walk around the school, live and learn in schools, end up deciding what um, needs to be improved in schools rather than the students of color who regularly are engaging in these spaces. Um, and then we also know that a lot of times district leaders approach youth voice partnerships as an exploitative um, practice where they're just trying to get the stories of youth of color so they can check that they've you know taken voices into account rather than um, engaging pedagogically to facilitate transformation and transformative learning for youth. And so as we were engaging in the course, it was a youth long course. Um, I co-designed it, I co-taught it. Uh, the students earned credit from it. Um, we, we started having these questions of was YVI actually transformative? There were definitely moments when we were wondering, did we fail? And then at the end, you know, what can we learn from going through the process? So we definitely did not set out to do research um, around this project. The, the project was our praxis. Um, but then we, we figured out that there were things that we actually needed to examine and, and we could learn. And so some of the questions that we have pursued through this project are um, around interrogating how district leadership practices resisted and maintain school leadership as white property. Uh, and then inquiring into curricular practices and inquiring into the importance of women of color educators in the process and the cost of the work. Um, for this presentation, I'll be focusing on us interrogating our the emergent pedagogy and the possibilities and messiness um, so that we can offer a model for expansive youth policy partnerships. 
So in terms of the context of uh, my work, this writing is framed by critical race theory and education and women of color feminisms, drawing on, building on the work of Derek Bell, Gloria Lutzen Billings and, and Bill Tate, Kimberly Crenshaw, Solorzano and Yoso, uh, Patricia Collins, Mari Matsuda, Audre Lorde and Gloria Anzaldua to, to name some of the, the work we, we draw upon. And so that frames our understanding of the context as well as the assumptions and goals that we went into the course with, uh, but we didn't quite know how, how we were going to enact this and what was going to come out because this was not an ethnic studies course because we were drawing um, youth from a variety of experiences from across the district. So this particular district uh, is characterized as being a white space, a white district in a white state which ends up erasing a lot of the communities of color that have lived there, uh, specifically native populations, indigenous peoples who, whose land it was and who continue to persist in the space, as well as black families who had been there for generations from the great migration to more recent immigrants who had come either as refugees or as, um, as they got displaced from their home countries uh, across Asia and Africa, um, and also uh, Latina students um, whose families were, were moving in, in the space as well in various ways. Um, the leaders were overwhelmingly white men, um, and, and in working with the district and working with teachers in the district, uh, all the people involved in the project had a sense of um, the deeply ingrained heteropatriarchy that was um, that guided and, and really served as a foundation for what, lead, what counted as leadership in the district. Uh, and the district was heavily invested in power evasive district improvement initiatives. So they had paid lots of money for these um, colorblind, race blind um, improvements around uh, assess, uh, standard race grading and particular pedagogical and instructional strategies. And so they oftentimes felt that their investment in the improvement initiatives came into uh, conflict with their actual equity goals. And so our assumptions started from uh, racism is permanent and endemic to society and schools, yet we strive to live in meaningful struggle. Uh, everyday experiences are shaped by interlocking and differential oppression. So we wanted to honor that different groups of color may experience differential oppressions that are also interlocking um, across various axes. Um, and that oppression is dismantled at institutional, interpersonal, and internalized levels. Uh, our goals for the course were founded in the importance of developing a socio-political consciousness, as Mari Matsuda calls it, drawing from W.E.B. Du, du Bois's idea of double consciousness and multiple consciousness um, with a focus on educational policy. Uh, we want to engage with the realities and knowledge of youth and communities of color as they were bringing them into the class and as they surfaced in the class and focus on collective learning and the idea that every individual had value and unique contributions to the conversation and in, in policy. Um, and we were also committed to addressing internal and external power dynamics as they emerged. Um, for our methods, I'll just briefly talk about our data sources. We were studying our own practice. So me and my co-author were studying our own practice. Uh, the data sources were our notes and agendas, curricular artifacts, reflective memos, and transcripts of our ongoing dialogue as we were trying to make sense of, of what was happening in the course. Um, and we followed a rigorous data analysis cycle, um, centering our ideologies, the learning goals, and the practices. That, that supported the work. Um, what we noticed is that there were these five curricular threads that we needed, that we were really engaging with as um, youth experiences were shared and as the youth and district leadership interacted. Um, so there were lots of opportunities for students to develop multidimensional self-representation. So we were talking about multiple oppressions, um, how, what was it like to be them in the school? What was it like to move through? What were experiences where their educational needs were met? What were experiences when they were not met? And the students continuously developed um, different kinds of self-representations. 
We also focused on um, knowledge and learning and different definitions of knowledge and learning, what counts as knowing, what counts as knowledge, and what counts as learning because the students were so ingrained with the idea that grades only, grade, only learning was only in, reflected in grades. We really had to do a lot of unlearning around the individualism and competition and grade-based orientation around learning. Uh, we also infused the curriculum with critical social theory so students could develop analytical tools and interpretive tools to recast their experiences in terms of you know, dominant narratives, counter storytelling, things like that, idea of intersectionality and resistance. Um, we also engage students with in practices related to analyzing policy and understanding policy as governing conditions, behaviors, and outcomes in schools, um, and really understanding that decisions were being made and that understanding policy involved asking about and analyzing how decisions got made in the school. And then coming back to the idea of resistance and transformation and policy work as voicing needs and acting for change and what counted as voicing needs and what counted as acting for change. Um, so our model, the, the, the main thing that we put forth in this paper is this model where if the purpose is expansive and transformative youth policy partnerships, we need to work with youth um, using these practices. And then in the um, boxes are, is how we did it locally. So there were three main practices that we definitely noticed we engaged in. So facilitating this multiple consciousness um, through illuminating dominant narratives, helping students re-articulate their experiences with an inter intersectional analysis. Um, the students really first uh, explained everything through individual psychological um, explanations. Like, I don't know, I'm just lazy, or I just, I just don't wanna do it, or I just don't like it and really helping them re-articulate uh, what was going on in terms of um, using critical social theory. And is, is the curriculum relevant? What are the patterns you see across everybody's experiences in the class? Um, something we noticed that was important were because of the critical social theory we were using and the way in which it got used sometimes that there were experiences that were invisibilized in the course. So for example, um, when trying to understand racism, uh, one of the students was trying to understand, well, can people of color be racist? And instead of asking more questions about what experience was specifically coming up for that, uh, we were using critical social theory that says, no, people of color can't be racist because racism is, you know, historical, this and that. And really what we missed out on was supporting her in thinking through the intersectional experience of being undocumented and experiencing racism, um, which was a particular experience that got erased or, or was made invisible in certain contexts. Similarly, when Asian American students were talking about experiencing racism, as that was coming to the surface, oftentimes that would get invisibilized in the group conversations around what mattered and what policies needed to be addressed. Um, so considering the kind of critical social theory we were using uh, came up as something that mattered as we were trying to facilitate multiple consciousness amongst this diverse group of students of color. Um, additionally, uh, this practice of teaching critical policy analysis skills. So really coming down to looking at patterns across the experiences students shared and offering policy-based explanations. So for example, it's not just bullying or it's not just kids being kids, like actually when there's targeted harassment happening, that there's policies around um, oppressions and, and targeted oppressions uh, that need to be addressed to, in order to make sure that all students are safe in, in the school. You know, there are particular students that aren't safe, whether they're undocumented, whether they identify as queer or trans, whether they are women, so a lot of the women started picking up on sexual harassment policy and dress code. So really supporting them in developing policy-based explanations. They created an equity agenda to give to the district. The district 
denied it and said they were only interested in men of color attendance. And so that's what the district was trying to push the youth towards. And so we had the youth interrogate and develop critical policy analysis skills where they interrogated the survey itself and how it posited black males as the problem um, without attending to racial oppression in schools as, as many black youth experience it while invisibilizing um, the experiences of other students of color in the class. And then learning how to say their experience as possession, positional truth telling, like from their standpoint, from their position in, um, in society. Uh, the uh, third practice was offering liberatory policy alternatives. So really centering um, the educational needs. It took us a long time to support students in even recognizing that they had needs and that they could share them and that it was the school's responsibility to meet them. Um, so really working on that and community accountability instead of punitive measures, and then being able to articulate the differential, um, different ways that policies could be, that the, it wasn't, things weren't just the way they were, you know, that we could actually ask for something different and imagine something different. Something that came up, a practice that came up um, as really important in this particular Youth Voice partnership um, was the need to teach students actual skills in forging coalitional practice. Uh, whenever the district came in and exerted external pressure to break solidarity, the students um, needed to learn the skills to be able to stand up to that or to be able to share their positional truth telling without shutting down other people's um, but we also worked with them on learning how to speak their own truths and how to speak across difference rather than trying to make everybody the same or shutting down and not speaking their experience. Um, also, one of the biggest things was resisting neoliberal and div divisive pressures. Uh, neoliberal agendas that the district brought in um, always attempted to break coalition so that students could not present a unified front. Um, so some of the takeaways in terms of the ideological principles in filming this pedagogical model, uh, the knowledge frameworks that are employed matter for students and how they're analyzing their experiences and what experiences can be analyzed. So beginning with intersectionality offers a way for multiply marginalized youth of color to surface experiences and, and, and analyses that often get elided in single access movements or district-led policy reforms. Um, also critical learning should heal. Processes need to exist to address the loneliness, loss, self-blame, victimization, disempowerment, and shame that comes up with uh, learning about oppression. Um, and I'm happy to answer specifics um, at, at a later point. And critical policy analysis and school improvement are forms of intellectual activism. You know, a lot of times we think about transformation only happening through direct action or taking to the streets. Um, and we wanted to work with youth to understand that this too was a form of activism, that academic intellectual activism um, was also important in, in bringing change about. And that critical race coalitional politics is integral to resist neoliberal policy reforms that pit one group against another, that dehumanize teaching and learning and dehumanize um, students of color in these academic spaces. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alicia Rusoja. I'm an assistant professor here at the School of Education, and it is a true honor and privilege to introduce um, Dr. Sofia Chaparro. So Dr. Chaparro is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, where she teaches in the culturally and linguistically diverse education program at the School of Education and Human Development. Her research investigates how race and class influence ideologies of language development and bilingualism, as well as equity in bilingual programs and for bilingual Latinx students and families. She obtained her PhD in educational linguistics from the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. And prior to graduate school, Sophia was a teacher in bilingual schools in Massachusetts and Texas. 
Sofia is originally from the border town of El Paso, Texas, where she grew up bilingually and biculturally. Bienvenida, Sofía. Es un placer tenerte aquí con nosotras. Muchísimas gracias, Alicia. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be with you all and to share some of what I have been thinking about recently. Um, I am an ethnographic researcher who has focused on bilingual education contexts. And the questions my research asks uh, have to do with ideas about equity, race, and language, as well as the experiences of Latinx students and families in US schooling. Before I begin, I want to share some lines that I have been thinking about. Ada Limon, who is our US, current US Poet Laureate, has a beautiful poem called Sanctuary. And it ends with these lines. To be made whole by being not a witness, but witnessed. Immediately, this brings to mind a question that Paris and Wynne ask in their text on humanizing research. What does it mean to be a worthy witness in qualitative inquiry? In this talk, I will be using my research as a launching point to describe the work of antropoesia or ethnographic poetry in representing the experiences of immigrant Latina mothers and to explore the affordances of this method of analysis and representation. Indeed, I will argue that antropoesia is one way to answer the call for humanizing research. And as Paris and Wynne remind us, this is research that takes as its starting point our participants' dignity and humanity, and does justice to the words and the worlds they share with us as researchers. So I will begin by jumping in with an example. The following ethnographic poem was crafted from an interview with Laura, who was an enthusiastic young mother who I met through my research with a newly founded bilingual education program. Laura had found out about the program after its first year and was trying to arrange for her son to be transferred to it. During our interview, Laura described to me the difficulty of getting the required documents to register at her previous school due to a difference in the address of some of her utility bills and her frustration in not being able to explain this situation. I will read the poems in Spanish and you will see the translation in English on the screen. ¿Qué no entiendes? Entonces yo fui ahí y me dijo la secretaria no. Fui tres veces y me dijo no. La verdad no fue nada amable. La última vez me dice, ¿qué no entiendes? Dice, hasta que tú no tengas tus papeles, yo no te quiero ver otra vez aquí. While Laura is describing this dialogue to me in Spanish, we can have the near certainty that it occurred in English. The area where this bilingual program was begun was historically not one that had many Spanish speakers until recently. And as such, public schools in this part of the city did not have many bilingual personnel, if at all. This poem highlights the everyday racism and discrimination the mothers encountered in their daily lives. Now within the research of immigration and education in general, we have a great deal of statistical and demographic information about the number of children who are immigrants or children of immigrants in our schools. We know that students will enter school needing instruction tailored to their emergent bilingualism. And as a field, we know how to support students' language and literacy development in more than one language. And we also know the kinds of dispositions needed from teachers to understand and teach bilingual immigrant students. And yet we know that research tells us that the majority of teachers may not feel well prepared to meet bilingual and immigrant students' needs, nor are they likely to understand the stressful experience of migration or how documentation status affects students and families. We know that Latinx immigrants face significant structural inequalities in the US, specifically along the dimensions of race, socioeconomic status, language, and documentation status. And that understanding the structural inequality is critical if schools are to serve immigrant students well. 
And yet deficit perspectives are common amongst educators, administrators, and other parents where a lack of visible participation from Latinx immigrant parents is often misrepresented as a lack of care or concern for education. The question then becomes, what kind of research will help us better understand the experiences of migration for families? How do we present such research to better prepare our current or future educators to understand the life altering significance of migration for each family and how it impacts the children's educational experiences? So let me briefly describe the context where these questions have emerged for me. My research has focused on specific kinds of bilingual programs called two-way immersion or dual language bilingual education programs. These bring together language majoritized and language minoritized speakers with the goals of bilingualism, biliteracy, and sociocultural understanding. In the US, these programs in their majority tend to be English and Spanish bilingual programs. The one program I studied specifically was made possible because of the ongoing processes of gentrification and immigration impacting this community, thus bringing together different groups of people in one social space with the goal of having their children become bilingual. I studied this program through 18 months of ethnographic participant observation, mostly being in the kindergarten and first grade classrooms and conducting interviews with parents and stakeholders. One of my study questions focused on families and understanding how their different trajectories and their cultural, racial, and linguistic backgrounds impacted their experience in this bilingual program. Now, to use only the linguistic background of children and families as a descriptor simplifies and obfuscates the trajectories of privilege and oppression, knowledges and needs that each family brings and that are key in their educational experience. In my initial analysis of parent interviews, the most common themes that came up in the qualitative coding process were the importance of school choice for white English speaking parents and the theme of immigrant experiences for the Latino parents I interviewed, most of whom were mothers. Yet what the Latina mothers conveyed to me was powerful, often painful, and were shared in such matter of fact ways that I at times missed the weight of what was spoken. I found that my initial analysis of coding and coming up with thema themes came short of doing justice to really evoking the lived realities that the mo these mothers were sharing with me. So I came to the work of anthropoesia as a more humanizing methodology. Poetry as inquiry is found across the social sciences. It is found in anthropological ethnography and in educational research. It can be characterized as a young branch of qualitative research and as a flourishing offshoot of arts-based research methodologies. It reflects a growing aesthetic move in the human and social sciences and perhaps reflects a need amidst the technocratic culture of our age and the narrowing of what scientific research means or what counts as evidence, especially in educational research. I take my inspiration from anthropologist Renato Rosaldo's work. R Rosaldo, in fact, was the one who coined the term anthropoesia, and he defines it as verse informed by ethnographic sensibility and as a process of discovery more than a confirmation of the already known. Rosaldo compares the process of anthropoesia as that of ethnographic analysis. He states, like an ethnographer, the anthropoeta looks and looks listens and listens until she sees or hears what she did not apprehend at first. Poetry forces us to pause, often a necessary intervention in the fast pace of our work. And in the words of Rosaldo, poetry brings things closer or into focus or makes things palpable. It slows the action, the course of events to reveal depth of feeling and explore its character. It is a place to dwell more than a space of quick assessment. After I realized my own shortcomings in the initial analysis, I went back to all the interview trans transcripts. I reread them. I selected small stories, critical moments, and poignant words. I experimented with the use of line, space, and rhythm. I kept participants' words intact. I've wrote, I wrote, revised, and sought feedback. I have published five poems in a previous article, 
And the following poetic transcripts I will share are currently works in progress. Language was central in the experiences of Latina immigrant women. As the first poem evoked, linguistic encounters were often the site of interactions where participants felt vulnerable, disrespected, and dehumanized. This poem addresses how language came up in other ways. These again are the words of Laura, who was simultaneously describing the worry of language loss with the worry of not being able to help her child in school or with the simple everyday task of helping with homework. Puro inglés. Y nada más de pensar de cómo le iba a hacer con la tarea. Ya empezaba a preocuparme. Mi hijo no iba a aprender mi idioma. No nos íbamos a entender. Desde antes me preocupaba. En la guardería, puro inglés, puro inglés. Y yo en el teléfono, traduciendo, traduciendo. Y es que cuando él estuvo pequeñito, no tuve la oportunidad de estudiar. Sí. Si sí, entiendo poco, pero no, no lo puedo hablar. Language loss was a worry that many of my participants described. Some as motivation to seek out the bilingual program and others like Laura with sadness of the possibility of their children not speaking their language and them not being able to understand each other. That experience can be quite profound as it represents an intergenerational break for transnational and immigrant families. In this poetic transcripts, we can picture Laura on the phone attempting to decipher meanings and the guilt and shame for not being able to speak the language when learning opportunities are denied for a myriad of factors, not the least of which is surviving in a new country and raising a family. Laura was relieved to have the gift of bilingual education for her child as it allowed her to participate more fully, not only with homework, but with knowing that yes, her son would speak her language. Yet, even when parents worried over intergenerational language loss, Latinx immigrants were constantly pressured to prioritize English over Spanish. There were strong discourses that discouraged Latino families from enrolling in bilingual education programs. And this next poetic transcripts underscores this discourse of immigrants needing to learn English. This, this poetic transcripts comes from my interview with Sandy, who was a key figure in helping get the program started. Now, while the school administration talked about the Latino community as wanting this bilingual program, they were not aware of the resistance that Sandy faced when seeking out signatures to support the program from Latino parents. It's important to emphasize that authoritative figures such as medical professionals often perpetuate the idea that immigrants need to focus on English at school at the expense of their first language. La doctora dijo, Yo anduve, pues sí, viendo a padres, ¿verdad? Para explicarles de lo que iba a tratar, para que ellos nos apoyaran con su firma. Pero pues, como siempre, hubo padres que nos contestaron mal. ¿Qué por qué? A pesar que eran hispanos, nos dijeron que sus hijos no iban a necesitar el español. ¿Qué por qué? Cuando ellos regresaran a su país, iban a poder trabajar como maestros de inglés. Pero yo les dije, ¿cómo van a ser maestros? si no van a poder traducir al español. E incluso en las clínicas donde llevé a mis hijas, la doctora dijo, usted encárguese del español en su casa y en la escuela el inglés. I want to end on a hopeful note and use again the words of Sandy. These words were spoken to me as she was telling me how one of the social workers at the school started asking her to help to come to school and to help communicate with parents. And slowly she started to feel that she mattered. Me siento bienvenida aquí. Sí, hasta me sentí como orgullosa. De que sí, mi voz ya tiene voto aquí. What does it take for a school or educational experience to go from the first poem, que no entiendes, to this? How can we as educators and educational researchers create more dignity affirming spaces where immigrant parents feel seen, valued and heard and have the right and opportunity to participate and engage fully in the education of their children? I have only been able to share but a snippet of the corpus of more than 16 poems from this research. 
taken together, the poetry of Latina immigrant women help us see the struggle of not understanding the language or the institutions one is expected to navigate, the discriminatory experiences and encounters in attempting to do so, the sadness of language loss, the English only discourses that scare and pressure parents, and the hope filled power of bilingualism and aspirations it brings. And these are all invoked in these lines. But to leave these human encounters and struggles under the umbrella code of immigrant experiences would be to miss the point entirely. Anthropoesia can offer the resonant power of poetic verse in order to understand immigration experiences in humanizing ways that force us to deeply consider the words and the worlds of our participants, our students, and their families. Perhaps this is one way to be a worthy witness, to, to do justice to what is shared and to how we share back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaparro, for such a powerful presentation. Hi, everybody. My name is Yanela Blanco, and I am one of the other uh, organizers for this event. And it is my honor to present to you our next speaker, Dr. Lauren Lee Kelly, who is an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University. She is also the founder of the annual Hip Hop Research uh, Youth Research and Activism Conference. Kelly taught high school English for 10 years in New York, where she also developed courses in hip hop literature and culture, spoken word poetry, and theater arts. Dr. Kelly's research focuses on adolescent critical literacy development, black feminist theory, hip hop pedagogy, critical consciousness, and the development of critical culturally sustaining pedagogies. Dr. Kelly's work has been nationally recognized, including receiving the 2022 Nasir Jones Fellowship at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, the 2022 Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowship, the 2021 Save the Kids uh, Hip Hop Activism Scholar Activist of the Year Award, and the 2020 American Educational Research Association's Writing and Literacy Special Education Group Early Career Award. Her scholarship has been published in several academic journals, and her research on hip-hop literacies and critical consciousness is the subject of several forthcoming book publications, including Teaching with Hip-Hop in the 12th grade, 7th through 12th grade Classroom, A Guide to Supporting Students' Critical Development Through Hip-Hop Texts, published by Rulidge. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much, Dr. Blanco, for the introduction, and thank you, Dr. Sheth and Chapato, for those amazing presentations. Um, I almost, I don't know if you all remember, there's a deaf poetry jam um, where Dave Chappelle gets on stage and he asks the audience to choose um, what poem he should present because he had multiple, one that he'd just written backstage. And I almost, after hearing those presentations, wanted to pull you all to ask what you wanted to hear. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to do the teacher thing where we decide the curriculum. Um, so thank you so much for, for inviting us here and, and putting this panel together. Um, and I love seeing how our work sort of overlaps and aligns. Um, so in general, my, my work is based on looking at youth agency, um, ways to foster youth agency and leadership and future building, um, and looking to youth culture and young people's epistemologies um, as we design pedagogies, as we design educational spaces, um, both inside and outside of schools. So I'm going to share with you um, briefly sort of two projects that I've been working on. Um, for the past five years, I've been co-organizing the Hip Hop Youth Research and Activism Conference um, with young people, primarily high school students, um, also some undergraduate students. Um, and we've been doing that, um, we did it virtual for two years and in person uh, for three years. We're actually hosting the 2023 conference next week at Rutgers. Um, and the idea is that all the workshops at this conference are youth-led, right? The conference itself is youth-led um, and the attendees are young people, high school and undergraduate students. And this work draws from a project I was working on um, when I was a doctoral student at Teachers College, where I organized an annual one-day youth summit that invited high school students um, and post-secondary students um, and young people to the college campus um, to engage in dialogues that are focused on the five elements of hip hop. Um, so that includes, for those who don't know um, and are new to this work, um, breaking, uh, also known as b-boying or b-girling, emceeing or rapping, graffiti, um, and um, DJing, and then the fifth element of knowledge. So each year I invited teaching artists um, to facilitate workshops around these elements. And then a scholar activist, um, Ernest Morel, um, came one year, Martha Diaz came one year to deliver the keynote address. 
And so after, um, is it advancing? After organizing this event for about five years, um, one day I was rereading Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Press, a book I'm sure many of us here are familiar with. Um, and I came to this sentence um, where he wrote, uh, and you'll see that I replaced the term laborers or peasants with students, because as I'm reading his work, that's sort of who I picture when we're talking about the oppressed, um, particular, particularly youth of color, um, or as Dr. Sheth would say, multiply marginalized students. And so, Ferry wrote, we simply cannot go to the students to impose upon them a program whose content we ourselves have organized. Many political and educational plans have failed because their authors designed them according to their own personal views of reality. And I felt um, <laughs> really struck by the sentence because I'd realized that as much as the event I was organizing, um, you know, was really powerful, it was well attended, people had a good time. I also realized that that's what I'd done, right? That I organized this program based on my own personal views and understandings of reality. Um, and I'd organized this space to be sort of an outside of school, although it was at, at a university, um, educational space that was for young people but I didn't design it with them, right? And I would always do a post-summit survey asking them their experiences, but I didn't do a pre-summit survey asking them who they wanted to teach the workshops or what they even wanted the workshops to be about, right? Um, I sort of designed all of the, um, the structures and the processes without inviting young people to be partners in that. Ferry goes on to write that the revolutionary effort to transform these structures radically cannot designate its leaders as its thinkers and the oppressed as mere doers. Leaders who deny praxis to the oppressed thereby invalidate their own praxis. And by imposing their word on others, they falsify that word and establish a contradiction between their methods and their objectives. If they are truly committed to liberation, their action and reflection cannot proceed without the action and reflection of others. And I interpreted that as my work in doing this sort of, um, this organizing hip hop educational and youth leadership spaces couldn't exist without doing it in collaboration with and in partnership with young people instead of for, right, or on behalf of them. And so I restructured uh, the summit to into the Hip Hop Youth Research and Activism Conference uh, established 2019. Um, and I designed it so that rather than me deciding all of these things, right, who is teaching, what is being taught, um, even the fact that there are concurrent workshops, right, was decided by me. I invited young people, um, and the first year was all high school students who applied to be co-facilitators of this conference and to design what is the theme what should the structure be? Um, they invited proposals from young people to teach workshops at the conference, and then they reviewed these proposals, right? Um, and decided based on their own epistemologies, their experiences, their identities as young people, um, and young people really connected to hip hop culture, who they wanted to invite to present at this conference. Um, and they ultimately decided that they didn't feel comfortable turning anyone away because they were like, these are high school students. They haven't written these proposals before. Many haven't taught before. So why should we expect them to come through sort of ready to go? Um, and so they actually designed the Leadership Institute in advance of the conference as sort of a training space um, to work with young people in developing their approaches to pedagogy, right? And developing um, how they're going to teach these workshops. And so based on the work, what I came to realize is that there are very particular ways in which young people based on their cultures or identities, their experiences in the world, world um, based on the age that they are, um, that they're actually developing approaches to pedagogy, right? They're developing critical theories of education. Um, and again, thinking about Dr. Chef's work around how do we invite young people into the space to think about educational design, to think about curriculum, um, I realized I wanted to know more about what young people have to offer schools um, and, and educational theorists even, right, around pedagogies. Um, and so the current project I've been working on, um, we started just this past January, so it's very recent. Um, and I invite any thoughts and, and questions and feedback that you all have. Um, it's called Remaking the World, Transforming Teaching Through Speculative, Youth Speculative Literacies, um, sponsored by the National Academy of Education and Spencer Postdoctorate Fellowship. Um, and the idea of this project is that it invited young people, again, high school students, some undergraduate students, all under the age of 21, um, to co-develop theories and approaches to teaching, and then to workshop those approaches with K-12 classroom teachers. And so, and I know I'm speaking really fast, but there's so much to talk about y'all, um, so please forgive that. Um, so this of course draws from critical pedagogy, um, work on youth voice and agency, and then ideas around radical imagination and social transformation, right, that we have to really radically um, 
recreate right and design spaces um, in order to think of a future that is free of oppression, right? That's free of inequity uh, inside and outside of school spaces. And so this work happened um, in four stages of design. Um, and this is from a methodological standpoint, a social design-based experiment, right? The idea that you're engaging multiple educational stakeholders um, in design and reflection and redesign, right? And implementation. And so in stage one, the learning stage, I conducted interviews with youth participants um, to learn more about their backgrounds in education. Right. As students in classrooms and as young people in the world, um, what have they seen? What have they learned? Right. What are their thoughts or epistemologies? And then they also learned about educational theories. Um, so I worked with two teaching artists who are also scholar activists um, to engage in conversations with the youth about how teachers learn how to teach. Right. Um, what is understanding by design? What is the Danielson framework and the domains of teaching? Right. So that they had a better sense um, and more transparency about why things look the way they do inside their classrooms, right? Um, even how units are designed, right? So there's some transparency there. And then stage two, the young people worked um, in collaboration and conversation with each other to design their own ideas and understandings and approaches to teaching. And then they tried those out. Um, and they actually had a practice session with um, some scholars, uh, master students, doctoral students, um, where they tried out what they sort of developed in their collaborative pedagogical design, got some feedback. Then they revised their approach um, to this teacher workshop and we're now in sort of this stage four um, where they're about to receive feedback from the teachers about how that went, how they've tried out these strategies in their classrooms, um, how they'd like to design this differently, and then thinking about what can they do with this work to sort of um, bring it into more classrooms, right? Are they going to teach workshops? Um, are they going to create a website? Um, and then we'll do some follow-up interviews over the summer about how this impacts their understandings of their own agency as young people. And so the research questions um, that drove this project and that are continuing, continually driving this project are what pedagogical theories and approaches do youth develop based on their collective identities and their speculative civic literacies? How does engagement in the design and implementation of pedagogical approaches for teachers impact young people? people's belief in their capacity to create meaningful change in society, and how do activist-oriented youth of color engage in dialogue and action as educational stakeholders in the process of social design-based experimentation? Obviously, we don't have time to discuss all of them, so we'll just talk about that first piece today in terms of the pedagogical theories. Um, and these images just give you some sense of the processes that were involved in their doing this work. Um, you see the agenda all the way to the left, um, and that's after months and hours of dialogue they came up with. This is how, um, with they had 90 minutes, how they were going to share this information um, with classroom teachers. Uh, and to give you one example of sort of the, the cyclical process of design and reflection and implementation, um, this sticky giant sticky note chart paper of post-its. Um, the idea of this activity was they wanted to model how students can communicate in classrooms and share their ideas without it always be raise your hand and speak or be in a Socratic seminar and speak or turn and talk. Um, and they're thinking about all the different ways that young people can communicate that don't, don't always require opening your mouth and speaking, right? Sometimes can they write it? Can they write anonymously, right? So that they don't worry about judgment or being right. So they did an exercise where they offered a prompt and the teachers, um, in the room, this was actually during the practice session. Um, so the um, adult partners in the room responded to the prompt on post-its. And what they realized in getting their feedback from the participants was that it was a little difficult for them to read each other's post-its because they're all on one sheet. And so this image in the middle is when they actually did the workshop for the second time after revision with teachers. And you see that they spread the post-its out to account for that feedback, right? And that they wanted their participants to be able to read the different post-its. And what they asked them to do was grab one that they resonated with, that they didn't write, read it out loud and share why it resonated with them. And their idea here was that they wanted students in classrooms um, to be able to feel seen, to feel heard, to feel like they're connected to others in a way that made them feel safe, right? It's the idea of anonymously sharing your ideas and having someone else in the room say, I feel this way too, right? Or this reminds me of this other thing that I've experienced help them to feel connected to each other and to feel like the classroom is a safe space for them to share these ideas. And so um, we're sort of breaking down these youth design pedagogies into two different um, two approaches. One is thinking about their values, right? And this is from my researcher memos, um, observing the conversations we have, observing them teach this workshop and then reteach it after revision. 
it was really important to these young folks. And obviously, this is not representative of all the young people, all those under 21 in America, but at least the group that I worked with, um, that they want their teachers to establish trust and vulnerability in the classroom, right? That that doesn't just come with the fact that you're a teacher, but they need to see it, right? They need the demonstration of teachers showing that they're also learning, right? That they're also human, they're also vulnerable. Um, and they wanted that within reason, right? They don't want to hear every single thing about your lives, right? They don't um, want to hear the intimate details of your marriage, your relationships, but they do want to know that you're also a growing person, um, that if you're asking them to be vulnerable, that you also have to show that yourself. They also wanted low stakes exercises in the classroom, that everything shouldn't be, some of the examples they gave of their experiences in classrooms was, this is 40% of your grade, right? This one test determines your entire future. Um, they want to engage in classrooms in ways where they don't feel like everything is so consequential, so that they can build up their skills, they can build their connections. And they also felt like they wanted to see that their safety, right, their physical, social, and emotional safety comes before their academic learning, right? Yes, it is important to learn the Pythagorean theorem um, and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, but also, do you care about me and my safety in this classroom space, right? Um, and so starting with check-ins was important to them, are the ways you can check in with your students um, to let them know that you were there for them, right, before you were there to teach this content area. Student choice was important to them. Again, thinking about different ways to communicate. Can I write today? Can I speak this other day? Can I choose this activity over this activity? Um, feeling like they have some agency in how they learn and engage in the classroom. Um, and there was some debate amongst this group around structures versus flexibility. Some of them said, I wanna know exactly what to do and how to do it and what it should look like and what the timeline is um, because that'll ease some of their anxieties around being wrong, right? And doing things incorrectly. Some of the other young people said, no, I like when there's some flexibility. I like when there's choice. I like when I can maybe choose my assignment or how I present it. Um, and so what they sort of collectively came up with was that they like having a balance between, yes, give me models, right? And give me some structures and, and guide me, but also give me some space to explore and create and figure things out. Um, and again, this is just one image from one of our activities over the course of engaging in this dialogue, um, that they came to these ideas through, through conversation, right, through sharing their experiences, um, that they came to realize that they have these values that then lead to what should be happening in the classroom. And so some of the strategies that they created uh, were building connections in the classroom, not only between teachers and students, but between students and each other. Um, and building those connections specifically through activities, right? Um, so not, you know, it's September 5th or September 10th, and we're in class for the first time, and turn to your partner and tell them, about an amazing moment in your life or tell them about your summer, right? That sometimes we have these like cold activities where they're supposed to be vulnerable with each other. And they're like, I just met you, right? Could we do a puzzle together first, right? Can we do some sort of challenge-based activity where we're building rapport with each other before sort of bearing our souls? Um, regularly incorporating different forms of check-in, right? Not just at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. Can it be every day? Can it be every week, right? Can we make sure that we're starting with how students are and where they are emotionally, psychologically before we get into the content area and different ways to check in. So maybe it's a journal entry, maybe it's a turn and talk, maybe it's small group conversations, maybe we change that up over time. That young people are interested in learning from and connecting with their classmates. Again, after developing the rapport, right, um, that they want to find ways to connect um, that are not necessarily talking all the time, right? Can there be silent activities or challenge activities? Um, and that they want a space to practice and receive feedback. Again, that's low stakes, right? That's not 40% of the grade all the time. Um, so even engaging in this project is one example of how they were able to try out this workshop, get some feedback. Um, they realized how it even felt to teach the workshop and realized that they needed to sort of do some rethinking. And then they got to teach it with the teachers, right? So having safe spaces to try things out first. Um, and student-generated content, right? Um, they have one activity where their participants came up with the questions that were going to be discussed instead of them all coming from the teacher. So how do students sort of develop the curriculum that they're engaging with? Um, and just some examples to get, you know, youth voices in the room, so it's not all me, some examples of some of the ideas that came out of the um, group interviews, and the in-person interviews, uh, Hugo said, so many times I've seen teachers who embarrass the students, for example, if they gave a wrong answer to a question, um, they would make fun of them, or just think, try again, how did you come to that answer, you're wrong, and I've seen this in the K-12 level, and even now in college, I've seen that, I feel that that's just a way that you make people not want to participate or scared to answer, even if maybe they know the answer and, and they're confident. That confidence is important and you just kill it when you do that. Um, and the last quote I'll give is from Erica, uh, who's a high school senior, when I asked the question, how, what do you think teachers are taught in order to be teachers, right? What is their training and um, what is their training involved? In your opinion, and Erica said, 
I'd also like to add, add on that I think teachers learned probably safety measures, how to keep kids safe, how to keep them from choking, or maybe like the Heimlich maneuver or something, stuff like that. Um, and that really struck me because my first thought was, no, I definitely never learned any of that. Um, but it also made me think about what students expect of us, right? They expect their teachers are entering classroom spaces ready to protect them, right? And skilled and equipped to protect them, literally to protect their lives. And oftentimes we enter classrooms and we're really ready to teach them about our content, right? And, and the things that we're an expert in. Uh, and finally, quick plug, um, my book is dropping in uh, July 11th. Um, June 20th is when the pre-order is available. So you can take a photo here. This has the discount code. So come June 20th, um, you can hop onto that uh, and purchase it. These are all strategies for teachers. They're lessons, um, handouts that you can use, um, that you can use to build your curriculum and teach in the K-12 or post-secondary classroom. And that is it. Thank you all so much. Excited to engage in conversation after our next presentation. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly and the rest of the panelists. Um, I'm Fahima Mustafa. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Education here at UC Davis. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Krista Williams, who is an assistant professor in the University of Georgia Lewis McBee Institute of Higher Education. She's also the director of the Education Policy and Equity Research uh, Collective, Ed Perk. Her research explores issues regarding equity in public policy with an emphasis on historically black colleges and universities, also known as HBCUs, and broadening participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for underrepresented groups. This line of research explores pathways into STEM fields from high school to college, as well as the relationship between institutional environments and successful collegiate STEM outcomes for marginalized groups. Dr. Williams employs multiple methods in her research, utilizing both qualitative and quantitative methodologies for a deeper understanding of students' STEM experiences. Prior to joining the faculty at University of Georgia, Dr. Williams was a faculty member at the University of Alabama, a senior research associate at the United Negro College Fund, and a postdoctoral fellow at Educational Test Testing Service, or ETS. Dr. Williams received the AERA Scholars of Color Early Career Award and the Excellence in Public Policy Award from the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Moreover, her expertise has been featured on National Public Radio, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. Dr. Williams attended the University of Michigan where she completed her doctoral studies in higher education and public policy and the Center for the Study of Higher, Educa higher and Post-Secondary Education. She also attended Clark Atlanta University where she earned her BS and MS degrees in mathematics and graduated valedictorian. Welcome and thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa, for that lovely introduction. I will share my screen. And while I am doing that, I just wanted to, again, thank you all for the invitation and thank the committee for doing such an exceptional job in putting this together. I've learned a lot and I've definitely enjoyed visiting Davis. So again, my name is Crystal Williams. I am an assistant professor of higher education at the University of Georgia. And the focus of today's conversation will really be about my journey in conducting education policy and equity centered research. So the formal title of my presentation is Towards Educational Equity and Policy, a Multifaceted Professional Journey. If I, if I were to give this presentation a subtitle, it would be my non-traditional pathway towards and into the academy. Um, but again, I just want to give you some broad overview of who I am as a scholar and the type of work that I do. So to give you some insight about today's agenda, I want to start off by talking a little bit about how I have come to do this work. So my personal background and how that shapes important aspects of my then research agenda, which is me really talking about exactly what that work is, right? So after that, I'll talk a little bit about the guiding lenses that I use in employing my research. And some I'll touch upon a few research studies that um, that have evolved from those guiding lenses. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's next or what's on the horizon in terms of my future work. So to give you some background information about myself and how my personal background has shaped various facets of my research agenda, I am originally from Fort Worth, Texas. So I am a Texan 
and I am from Fort Worth, Texas, not to be confused with Dallas, Texas. <laughs> we had a fun conversation about the differences between Fort Worth and Dallas last night. So I am a native of Fort Worth, Texas in particular. And after high school, I actually attended an HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia, Clark Atlanta University, where I was a math major. So I was a Black woman at a Black institution studying mathematics. And that formative experience really helped to shape some very important parts of my research interests, especially as it relates to the experiences of marginalized populations in STEM, and as it relates to the contributions of HBCUs to the higher education landscape. So I went to Clark Atlanta. I got my master's and my bachelor's in mathematics, and I took that insight and really started working initially for the Navy. So I worked at a think tank called the CNA Corporation. It is a federally funded research and development center for the Navy specifically in the DC area. And like a lot of think tanks in that area, it had a number of different projects. And so I started off doing a little bit of missile defense work, believe it or not. And I had an opportunity while I was there to kind of maneuver into some of our education facing research. And so um, the organization at the time acquired a, um, a regional education laboratory, the Appalachian Regional Education Laboratory. And that was my, my first entree into doing education research. Really liked it, really enjoyed it, was really curious about the experiences of students like myself at Clark Atlanta. So I took that curiosity to the University of Michigan, where I did my doctoral work in the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education, CSHP, CSHPE. And my concentration there was on higher education policy with a focus on critical connections between uh, K-12 and higher education. While I was at the University of Michigan, I had the pleasure and honor of getting exposure to a different type of institution, uh, community colleges, a community college specifically. So um, I had a chance to work in institutional research at Washtenaw Community College, and that was a very good um, very good intellectual and practical experience to really learn a lot about institutional policies as a complement to my work in federal policy and also as a complement to what I was learning in the text as a graduate student studying policy issues in higher education. So I took all of that curiosity and said, you know what, um, I don't want to be a faculty member. <laughs> At that point in time, I did not want to be a faculty member. Um, I wanted to go back to policy because that's where I started and that's where I saw my career taking me. So once I finished my doctoral studies, I actually did a uh, postdoc in Princeton, New Jersey. I was an AERA ETS postdoctoral fellow at the Education Testing Service and um, learned a lot about testing there, learned a lot about measurement, learned a lot about, I learned a lot about psychometrics, but also learned a lot about equity and policy issues as it relates to testing and testing products. So that was a really good experience. Took that experience and decided to move back to DC because DC is amazing. So I um, started working at UNCF, United Negro College Fund, and the Frederick D. Patterson Research Institute, which essentially is a research arm of UNCF. Um, and there I learned a lot about federal policy issues and equity issues as it relates to HBCUs, which mapped quite nicely onto my personal background as an HBCU graduate. So I took all of those experiences and then I said, I said, you know, I think I do want to try to be a faculty member. I think I want to try this on. And so I uh, started my first academic post at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And now I am an assistant professor of higher education at the University of Georgia. So those various experiences really helped to shape important parts of my overarching research agenda. As Dr. Mustafa pointed out, I consider myself a question-driven scholar. And so I really let the question drive the methods. I conduct qualitative and quantitative research using various critical lenses. My general focus is on race equity and education policy issues. And my guiding questions tend to fall within two areas. One, broadening participation in STEM with an emphasis on racially marginalized groups and low-income students. And then also minority serving institutions, specifically the contributions of HBCUs to the, to the modern higher education landscape. So as I said before, I use a number of critical lenses in conducting this work. I'll take a couple of minutes to discuss some of these and to point out some of the related research in those particular areas. 
First, much of my research employs role strain and adaptation framing, uh, specifically the Bowman role strain and adaptation model. This is a strength-based model, which emphasizes a couple of really important things. One, this concept of student role strain, which represents the challenges that students, challenges or strains that students encounter in academic spaces that can hinder success. But then also as a strength-based model, it notes how students are able to pull from multi-level um, strengths as, uh, uh, as adaptive resources or resources that promote adaptive coping despite those challenges. So it's the interplay of not only, it's the interplay of the challenge and the strengths, not just a focus on challenge. Um, and so that's the critical aspect of this particular model. Just to give you an example of some of the work that I've done that has built upon this concept, here are a few example papers. This one is one of the latest ones. It is a critical quantitative study. It's one I'm very excited about actually because it was my first publication with one of my students, the now Dr. Sarah Shaveda Davis, um, who was a proud graduate of the University of Alabama. So I'm very happy to be able to share this work um, with other people um, as a result of working very closely with one of my graduate research assistants. And the focus of this particular paper is on math achievement outcomes for black and brown students, specifically how students' prior math challenges can actually create barriers to the benefits of positive psychological disposition. So a lot of the literature will talk about the positive impacts of math identity, for example, or math self-efficacy. And what we argue here is that those relationships exist, but they, they exist for certain types of students. And so we really need to be more nuanced in our understanding of those psychological benefits, absent of a critique of opportunity structures that create barriers for um, prior exposure to mathematics specifically. So the second study is actually a qualitative study, and it is on Black males in graduate engineering programs. It's something I co-authored with Drs. Burt and Smith. And the focus here is on ecological and social impediments to success, such as racialized admissions, uh, admissions practices, um, specifically attacks on affirmative action and how that leaves a lot of black males in graduate engineering programs feeling isolated. In addition to the, the negative impact of um, biased social interactions with faculty at the graduate level. So that's this particular study with again, Dr. Spurt and Smith. And then the final piece that I'll point out here is also a critical quantitative study with one of your esteemed colleagues here at the University of California, Davis, Dr. Mustafa. Again, this is another critical quantitative study. It focuses on black males at an earlier point in their academic trajectory, specifically middle and high school. And again, examining um, the interplay between challenges and strengths and how that has an impact on math achievement earlier in the pathway towards uh, being a STEM major in college. Also in terms of lenses, some aspects of my research employs culturally affirming framing. I primarily draw upon three bodies of work with this particular uh, series or, or line of my research. Each of those bodies of work recognizes the cultural resources that racially marginalized students bring to educational spaces that can help to foster achievement. One of those bodies of work you may be familiar with is culturally relevant pedagogy from uh, Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. It encompasses really three key areas, um, academic success, cultural competence, and sociopolitical consciousness. I also employ some of Harris's work on culturally sustaining pedagogy, which um, builds upon uh, quite a bit uh, the principles of CRP, but centralizes the need to sustain students' cultural ways of being rather than erasing them from the educational process. And in addition to that, I borrow quite a bit from Museus's work on culturally engaging campus environments, um, which is a very good model that highlights various institutional factors that affect college student success for racially diverse student populations. Um, as this relates to my research, I am particularly interested in this emphasis on culturally relevant knowledge and then also culturally validating environments. And so to give you a sense of some of the work that has come from this, these particular frames, here I have um, two companion qualitative studies of HBCU leadership, leadership. 
And so in these studies in particular, we were able to interview presidents, HBCU presidents, other high level administrators and faculty on those campuses. And again, these are um, the birth child of myself and a number of students I've worked with, including uh, Alethea Russell, Kiara Somerville, Erica Campbell, Richard Jowers, and then uh, Dr. Mobley is one of my esteemed colleagues who is now at Morgan State. So the first study actually focuses on culturally affirming institutional practices at HBCUs and how they benefit Black students. But the second study actually looks at culturally affirming institutional practices and how they benefit students who are oftentimes placed at the margin of higher education, specifically in predominantly white institutions. So looking at low income students, as well as students who are the first uh, in their families to attend college. And then finally, other aspects of my research focuses on or employs lenses that really talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, race and racism in more direct ways. Some of this work utilizes critical race theory, which has become a topic of much conversation publicly um, and, and is a useful framework for understanding racial issues within America. I also draw quite a bit on Dumas's work on anti-Blackness scholarship, which provides a framework for critiquing deficit-laden perspectives of Black individuals and communities. And so to, just to illustrate my utilization of these lenses. Here I have another qualitative study. In this particular analysis, we focus specifically on the voices of HBCU presidents, and the emphasis is on the modern contributions of HBCUs to the higher education landscape in a couple of different areas. One, um, in different facets of leadership development for Black students, and then also in serving students who have extreme financial barriers within their homes, as well as those who have been academically marginalized within K-12 systems. I have been pretty fortunate to have this work funded both externally and internally from a number of different sources. Here I have some of them listed. So I've been able to um, get support from AERA, uh, several funding streams from the National Science Foundation, and also some seed funding from my institution. I'm currently in the process of developing a proposal for the NSF racial equity and STEM funding stream. And that now sets me up nicely to talk a little bit more about what's on the frontier next. So my next line of research will really focus on two particular areas. The first of which actually brings together two of my current branches of research, and this will focus on HBCU's contributions to STEM diversity. I'm in the process of collaborating on some research regarding these issues with Dr. Ivory Tolson, who is the Director of Education, Innovation, and Research at the NAACP, as well as an esteemed faculty member at Howard University. And in addition to that, I have a recent piece that was published that conceptualizes how aspects of HBCU environments foster Black student success in STEM areas. So that's one thing that's on the horizon. And the next thing that's on the horizon focuses on race and gendered experiences of Black women, in particular in STEM. I have a conceptual piece that's under review that starts to engage some of this topic, building upon existing literature, uh, building upon the Bowman role strain and adaptation model. But in this particular piece, I actually develop a new framework specific to understanding the experiences of Black women, in particular uh, in STEM spaces. And building upon that work, I actually have great news to share that I was recently recommended to have my NSF career proposal funded. And that, that proposal, that work will be a mixed method study that examines the race and gendered experiences of Black women in computing specifically. So very excited to uh, stand that study up fairly quickly. So having said that, I, will, um, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my research team. I have the honor of doing this work in collaboration with some awesome students at the graduate level, uh, PhD students, master's level students, as well as undergraduate students. And we are the Education Policy and Equity Research Collective, better known as EdPERC. So we do invite you to please follow us on social media. And our handle is at EdPolicyEquity. 
And to wrap things up, here is my contact information. I would love to be in touch if you're interested in learning more about any of that work that I kind of went through very quickly. Um, it's all available on my website. You can also reach out to me directly through my email. And we can also be in communication via Twitter through um, either of these handles. And then I also have a QR code for my business card if anyone would like to have additional information about being in contact. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Crystal Williams um, and everyone, all, all our presenters today, Dr. Sophia Chaparro, Dr. Lauren Kelly, and Dr. Unali Sheth. Um, I, I also want to thank the organizing <clears throat> team of my colleagues for inviting me to share just a few words uh, reflecting on the presentations we heard today by our guests. Um, and as I think of them collectively, I want to acknowledge that we were, were gifted with um, hearing from, um, I, I won't even say emerging scholars who are already here and, and changing the field of education, changing the field of educational research, and, and, and inviting us to ask different questions, inviting us to question everything. Uh, particularly from um, the stance of women scholars of color um, who are conducting research with a range of, of, of um, communities. All, all four scholars are, are in, encouraging us and I, I want to say demanding us to, to question our, our, our theories, to question our, our methods, question our pathways to academia in ways that can really help um, shape the way we engage um, as academics, the way we engage with our, what we call participants, but really our collaborators and how we engage with practitioners and communities across our work. I'm just gonna share a, a few words about each one of the papers. And for any, for, for me, it's just really thinking as I, I listen to each one of the papers um, and presentations, just what, what I felt invited to think about. So for, with Dr. Manelli Sheth, I would thank you so much for um, really having us think about what it means to invite youth into spaces that are typically adult, where, where decisions are adult driven. So your statement about developing youth voice initiative to help inform school districts and their equity agendas, you have to imagine how you can be authentically involved in these spaces. And I really appreciate you calling out the exploitative nature of districts in their engagement of youth. And, and I've seen this in so many um, programs, um, youth participatory action research projects where, um, the youth were often applauded for their presentations, um, but we never seen this work enacted. Um, Dr. Melanie Bertrand actually did some work um, really thinking about what happens afterwards. And I see your work really taking up that call and saying, we, we, we don't want to be performative. These youth have something to add. And I just really want to thank you for, for um, even framing that in your work and making it a centerpiece of the work that you are doing with alongside youth and other practitioners at your site. Dr. Sofia Chaparro, um, thank you again for, for I have to confess, this is the, the I've, I've seen um, this work and, and it's exciting work around anthropoesia. Um, Dr. Chaparro, you really have us ask, ask the bigger question, what kind of research will help us better understand the experiences of immigration for families? And, and I, I take this question, what kind of research will help us better understand? And we can add what our interest here um, and what I really enjoyed that you, what you invited us to think about is how we need to consider um, our ways of analyzing data. Okay, we, we, we often think about methods and we think about our ways of conducting methods, but you bring us to analyzing data by questioning your codes and, and themes and doing that reflective work that acknowledges that the work that the analysis did not capture what mothers were saying prompted you to go dip, to dig deeper and to really try to think about what else needs to happen. Um, so, so thank you for the beautiful words that you shared of, um, from and by your participants. Um, and it really makes me think about how do we write culture? And, and we've been grappling with this question since uh, Clifford and Marcus have, have, have um, put it forth to us. But here, Dr. Chaparro, you, you, Matt, you encourage us to rethink how we present and represent the voices, voices, words, palabras of the folks in the, uh, that, that we do work with. So I really want to thank you for bringing that to us um, in, the, in this space here. Um, Dr. Lauren Kelly, um, your work, again, invites me to think about what is possible when we, and I, I'm going to step back here, not when we give youth, when we invite youth into 
thinking about what it means to to think about, to dream about, to um, enact pedagogy and and to create, to lead other young people, to to lead teachers. Um, your presentation really got me thinking about what, like how we um, can, you know, uh, need to really think about what your what the youth in your work are doing, your collaborators are doing, and how powerful this can be. As <laughs> I'm thinking, as an English methods course or any methods course, just to really when we think about how youth voices can be brought into these spaces, you provide with us with a powerful example of youth telling us, right? Telling our teachers, this is what we want. And, and, and I, I think the reflexes, um, the, the reflexivity that you have to engage in as researcher, teacher, facilitator, collaborator with these youth really is really um, shines through this work. Um, and I, I'm gonna be left with this idea of ready to protect, this idea that we have to be ready pr to protect the youth. Teachers need to be ready to protect youth in many ways, in, in, in ways that your the youth um, highlights by providing, just in making sure we're, we're safe and we can do CPR in the room, but really to protect youth lives. And, and I wanna thank you for the work. Dr. Crystal Williams, I wanna um, thank you for um, highlighting what, yeah, your, your secondary title, your non-traditional pathway towards into the academy is, is a powerful um, narrative of, of how we don't have one, one way to get to where we're at. If um, you, you highlighted for us, uh, the other thing you invited, you asked, you, you encouraged me to, or invited us to think about is how our cultural historical past really matter to the work we're doing today as scholars. Um, your experience at an HBCU, your experience as a black woman in math education and what that meant afterwards. And even when those different, when you, you took up um, roles in the different institutions that you were part of, um, think tanks, um, in, um, universities, um, you, the past was always part of what you were doing. And, and I think it encourages us, I'm thinking about undergraduates or master students and PhD students, even faculty members that it made me think about we're, there's so many spaces we can take our work to, um, so many questions that we continue to ask. Um, and for many of us, it's grounded in those pasts. And I think naming it, calling it, um, calling it out and bringing it to a space in academia like this really gets us to rethink that there is not just one way, especially for scholars of color, there have been many paths to um, academia. So I wanna um, thank you all for joining us here at the UC Davis School of Education. Joining, I'm gonna just say, joining the legacy of, of UC Davis um, Emerging Scholars Panel um, guests. And um, at this point, I want to encourage our, um, I wanna encourage anyone um, on, on, in this webinar to ask questions to anyone on our panel and I will facilitate this conversation. So right now, um, I hope our guests, if you can make yourselves appear on screen, I want to thank you all. I hope we can hear all the applaud across the the uh, our um, the web. <laughs> no, we can't. We don't have access to um, to emojis, but I will open it up now to any questions from our from our guests, our our participants. As folks are throwing their questions in, I just want to say one more time, I'm so, I'm just, y'all's work is amazing and deeply inspiring and impactful and, and layered and powerful. And thank you so much for doing what you do and doing it in communities, which um, that's just something that's at the core of my heart as well. Gonna give folks a bit of time just to. I, I will. I will start us off with a question um, that we can perhaps. Um, we can. You can all take time to answer. Um, I'm really thinking about. You all have have made us question the role of um, how we engage our youth, how we um, how we engage analysis, how we engage learning. How we engage our pathways. So there's just like we, when we think about academia, we think about one way. Can you all talk about the 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 thing you all go back to when you're sitting in your office, engaged engage in that that work? What's the thing that you all go back to that that um 
that lets you know that you're doing the work that you came here to do. The re-asking the questions that you were put here to, to ask. Um, because I, I'll say this thing, I believe you are asking questions that are like from your heart really, but also from, um, your, your, again, I'll say from your cultural historical past. So I guess briefly to start us off, I know I see the questions coming in. If y'all can just share briefly what those experiences are. I can share something very quickly, um, just to answer in a very a brief and direct way. Um, so on the way out here yesterday, as I was traveling, I received um, a text from one of the young people involved in this project that I shared. And it's a, it's a photo of a whiteboard that says, does hip hop belong in the classroom in one corner? And then take a post-it, reply and paste it here. And it looks like this is something she taught. She didn't give me the context. I'm like, was this during school, after school? She's in a, a future teacher's program. Um, but it says just showing you how much this work inspires me. And I think that to me, like we don't ever expect things like that, like immediate feedback, like we just met this year in this project, right? Um, but to see how young people are taking up this work in their own way. So what she's doing is not anything I did, right? But it's her sort of engaging with these conversations and spaces and doing her own version um, and building that out. And I think that's what we do, right? Is to create these spaces where young people um, can be our future leaders and our, our current leader, not even fear, like they're leading today and right now. I, oh, oh, go ahead, Crystal. No, oh, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I really like this question because one of the things I've always desired in my career is for my work to have reach. And when I say reach, I don't mean academic journals. <laughs> Although we know that's what the Academy will, that's the awards, the reward system, right? Uh, when I say reach, I'm thinking about who does this work matter to and who does it help? Um, and, and is it helping anyone, right? So I'm always asking myself that question. I'm always coming back to that question. And I'm always thinking about how to get this work into the hands of people who can actually use it to move the needle on things that I care about. So for me, that's been working in different policy spaces. That's where I started my career. Even though I'm in an academic context now, it's very important that I, I remain connected to those spaces because you know, getting your work into policymakers' hands is what can help to move the needle. And then also I'm starting to think more creatively about dissemination. So one way of sharing our work is through the traditional outlets, you know, going to conferences, um, you know, publishing in, in journals and things of that nature, but also thinking through how does this work get into the hands that pe of people who can actually move the needle? Um, how is it actually helping someone? So I've started to think more creatively about that process Still maintaining my publication record and things like that, because we know that's a necessity, but also thinking about how to be able to really help the demographics I care about with the work that I'm doing. For me, I think I always imagine teachers as my audience in one way or another. Um, and often it's myself in what, what would have helped me when I was a teacher? What do I wanna hear? What are the kinds of things that move me? To, to teach in particular ways or, or to act in particular ways. And so I think for me, what has been uh, the most rewarding is to have the opportunity to share my work with classes of you know, current teachers, future teachers, in like teacher-oriented conferences. Um, and I had the you know, pleasure of, of um, presenting some of my earlier work in a local Colorado conference and a teacher I knew was part of it. And first of all, just being there for the discussion, right? And, and see what emerges has been really amazing to see. And then this one teacher um, then later shared that, you know, she, she talked about this presentation in one of her master's papers as like continuing to like re reminding her of why she did what she did. And that was just such a gift for me to, to, to hear. Right, that maybe what I did was agregando mi granito de arena, right? Like adding my little grain of sand and in, in the kind of impact I want to have. Yeah, similarly, I would say sometimes we get direct feedback, sometimes we don't. Um, but getting feedback that people, women of color, queer students of color, um, are able to see themselves differently and see themselves in academic spaces differently and push back in academic spaces differently. Um, and I also always ask myself, who got left behind, 
whether I was it, whether I was the teacher in the space or not, like who is left behind and have there been shifts in opening up spaces um, that didn't previously exist for people who are wondering, how do I speak up? You know, do I have a voice? Does my voice matter in any of this? So. Thank you. Thank you all. We have we we have a question now from someone in the audience, Dr. Rebecca Ambrose asked us to, um, she points us to Manali in your subtitle that said, school is a lie. So the question is for everyone, how how each one of you um, react to the claim that, that school is a lie based on, on the work that you all are doing? And Manali, you can also ex expand on this as well. Yeah, I'll just say the origin of the quote. <laughs> it was a student, a youth in the class. Um, she was, she wanted to investigate sexual harassment and how um, young girls experience sexual harassment. I just asked her, you know, you identify as Asian American. Do you want to focus on Asian American girls and how they experience it? And her response was not really. And I said, oh, that's fine. You can do whatever you want. Can you tell me why? Um, she said, because I guess Asian American girls don't experience sexual harassment. Um, it took all I had to not flip the table over um, and instead just kind of said, well, let me tell you a little bit about the history. Like, are you, are you curious about how Asian American women from Asia oftentimes arrived first um, in the US? And so I gave her a, a little bit of history and her and one of the other students basically like with no affect on their faces just said, you know, school's, school's a lie. Um, so that's where the quote came from in terms of just that, that coming to the surface of how much, how much they had experienced in their schooling that um, really, really needed to be interrogated, so. That's where the quote came from. Thank you, Manali. So would, the question is how each one of you respond to that in, in terms of the, your work. I'm happy to chime in a little bit mm -hmm. here. Um, I can't speak to the quote itself, right? Because you have to understand people's comments and context. But when I hear that, the idea of school is a lie as a higher education scholar, the thing that resonates with me is a critique of rhetoric that we see coming from uh, higher education, uh, especially as it relates to profess commitments to diversity that don't align with practice. <laughs> So when I think about this idea of, of school being a lie, I think about, you know, the ways in which, you know, some of our institutions say that we really want to advance issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, so on and so forth. But then we refuse to align our practices with that particular goal. Um, and for me, I think it's very helpful when students are reflective about that um, and bring that insight and critique the fact that, you know, in, in some instances, institutions are presenting a lie. Um, I encourage that. I think it's also important to help students to learn how to navigate those spaces and to disrupt um, the practices that are a hindrance from the actual realization of those commitments. I think for me, what that brings up is this idea that when we you know, immigrant students are students that come from all sorts of backgrounds and experiences and trajectories. And in educational policies, often texts and research, we, we subsume them under this term of English language learner. And by doing so, we simplify the problem. And, and I was recently reading something by Lee Patel, who talks about how we find this individualistic and technocratic solution to the problem. And it's just about immigrant students needed to learn English and need to learn English the fastest and most efficient way possible. And this is how we fix the problem, right? And there's versions of that discourse, right? Oh, if only 
immigrant students and students of color learn academic language, then we'll have then we'll you know get rid of the problem, or then there will be similar academic outcomes. And so I think those are the kinds of thoughts and ideas where you know that that phrase um, brings up for me and the education of immigrant bilingual students. Um, and yeah, and that you know we try to find you know, the academic solutions for inequalities that are across society, right, that are not just about school and learning, you know, these are, you know, part of institutionalized racism and oppression. And so, you know, we can't fix these, but these individualistic technocratic solutions. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I agree. I don't, I think if you shared that quote with most of my students that I've taught ever at, at any level, they would say, yes, it is. Um, but I, what I find, something I find really hopeful in the work, um, and I think everyone's kind of, your projects speak to this, is that I think as much as young people generally and students generally understand the fallacy and, and the hypocrisy of schooling, they also, they're still in it, right? If they've been our students, whether it's like voluntarily, because um, they're after the age of 16 or, you know, mandatorily, um, they're like, I'm here, right? So there's some hope in it. The fact that they show up means that they see themselves um, in some ways as able to, you know, change it or engage it in a way that's honest and that's truthful. Um, and I'll share the quote that I skipped um, from Allison, who's a high school junior, I think speaks again to that idea. Um, she said, I think this generation of students is definitely, and I believe she meant high school students, they learn a lot different. And I think it's the generation that's getting talked about the most right now, getting judged most of the time too. It's like, oh my God, you're Gen Z. I think we're very passionate about changing the world. I think it's a huge Gen Z thing. And I also think that's what teachers became teachers for. So it's like, we're not, not that different. And I love that idea that she's sort of, I don't even know if we see this, right? She was like, if you're a teacher, it means we kind of signed up for the same project. You want to change the world, we want to change the world, but you act like we're aliens out here, right? And I think it's sort of this calling out of the hypocrisy and also wanting to be part of that change. And that's what I notice in this current generation of young people. Thank you, thank you all. I, I have another question from the audience um, who's asking, um, you you all talk about you doing your work, you're bringing in critical frameworks, asking questions. So the question is, how do you um, do this work, work knowing that there are people who may not be supportive of this work, for example, current um, anti-CRT folks who argue that racism doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. And I, and I, I just want to frame, like, I know we do this work oftentimes not paying attention to these voices, but they're always there, right? So I just want the quite are just thinking about how you all engage this work knowing this. I mean, for me, it's, you know, sharing mother's words, right? These encounters, there's many of them in the corpus, right? And they're just interactions. And they describe particular ones, but in the way that they describe them, they you can tell they were everyday occurrences, mm -hmm. right? Of, of how Latin immigrant women interfaced with institutions and how they had to face these constant microaggressions, right? You know. For me, it's not so much something that I can really ignore to be completely transparent because geographically in the state of Georgia, it's not, <laughs> it's not I don't have the luxury and privilege of ignoring it <laughs> to be completely transparent. Um, but the way that I have come to grips with it is to understand what my commitments are and to be true to my commitments, to be true to my value system and to not be discouraged by the fact that other people may not see this as something that's real. Um, quite frankly, I don't really care what other people think. I know what I, I know what I plan to pursue. I know what questions are important to me. I know what questions brought me to the academy and I remain committed to those. And so that would be my encouragement for other people. Know what the, what, what the work with a big W is for you, right? Um, an individual study could be the work with a small w, but the work with the big w is really what do you see as your values and how the work that you do on the day-to-day -day maps onto that. And so as long as you can stay focused on those commitments, then the naysayers don't really become that relevant for you. So I I second and, and will echo um, what Dr. Chapato shared, which is like, we use the research, right? Um, and I think, you know, for 
parents, um, administrators, teachers, right, that, that have the naysayers that have these critiques and say, well, if you're invested in teaching children and if this is what the children are saying, like, like they're asking for this, right? So how do you also turn around and say that this isn't good for them or they don't need it, right? You're saying that you know more than these young people about their lives and their experiences in school. And so definitely using using the work, using the research, um, you know, sharing your people's voices, highlighting and centering the voices, elevating them, make sure that, that they're heard. Um, and I think the second thing that took me a very long time as a teacher to learn and to process, because um, I would ask that question all the time, um, you know, doing like Black feminist work, for example, in predominantly white spaces and getting pushback um, from students. This is not even just like the outside they say, but students in the classroom. I think a lot of us have had these experiences and folks would say to me, um, well, you know, you have to you have to get, you know, a co-conspirator, you have to get a white ally to come. And I was like, that feels unsustainable. Like I, I need to get a guest speaker every day in my classroom to say the same thing I'm saying, like in a different body, and then it's fine. Um, but what, what it finally came to me, like the, the way that I was able to get on board with that plan was that some things are not my work and it's not my work to convince people to care about race. And it's not my work to convince people that they're, you know, enacting injustice. Um, and so I try to work, you know, in spaces where people are want to do, they know what the work is and they want to figure out how to do it together. Um, and I let that be someone else's work, if that makes sense, right? Um, so those who are writing books about anti-racism, they should be called upon, right? If this is the work that they've chosen, if they say, this is my expertise, um, and I would say call upon those people to do that, but it's not for everyone to be teaching everyone about you know, their injustices. And I've decided that's not my work. I wanted to follow up on what you said, um, Lauren, because I think that's very important too, because sometimes in classes, students will uh, ask questions that are beyond my area of expertise related to issues of race and racism. And I think it is important to be able to call upon the experts, right? Like I'm an expert in this particular domain. This is my space. And this is what I'll talk very freely about. But then to know when you're when there are other people who know it more intimately and being able to reference their work and elevate their voices in the learning context. I think that's very important too. Yeah, I would just add, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit during the grad student luncheon, um, but knowing what your work is, knowing what your purpose is, um, knowing what the consequences of doing the work and the ways you do them is important. Um, I also think it's important to build the community around you so that you like on days when you just can't deal with whatever came through um knowing that you're not alone knowing that there's always been pushback um i think these things help of not seeing yourself as like doing this work alone um but rather that you're part of a chain of of people and communities that have consistently been pushing back and and persisting Thank you. We have a, a question for Lauren. Um, question asks, the 50th anniversary of hip hop is here. Has that helped to increase teachers' willingness to use hip hop in their curriculum? Um, and is there any evidence that basic knowledge about hip hop, um, for example, the four and five core elements that, that these are taught to teachers? I love, thank you uh, for bringing up the 50th anniversary, the upcoming birthday um, of hip hop. For those who don't know, August uh, 1973, um, I believe August 11th, um, Cedric Avenue in the Bronx. So I don't know, I don't know if I personally observationally have evidence um, that the anniversary itself is sort of pushing teachers or educators to engage in the work. But I will say from more of a structural level, it has certainly pushed structures, right? Um, more sort of uh, historically um, Eurocentric structures to operate a little bit differently. So one example for those who are at AERA, the Amer American Educational Research Association um, annual conference recently in Chicago, um, there was an exhibit, right? A 50, 50th anniversary of hip hop exhibit um, that was in the space, right? That was physical, um, that really celebrated um, those who often aren't, like those who are doing youth engaged work, right? Those who are doing um, YPAR, the Cyprus for Justice was, was celebrated, hip hop archivists like Martha Diaz. So folks that aren't typically um, sort of even seen as hip hop scholars, um, a lot of community engaged work was really celebrated and, and highlighted and centered. Um, also, I just um, went to uh, the Fotografiska Museum the other day in New York City, which has two floors 
um, of photographs sort of documenting the history of hip hop and the culture of hip hop um, and the lives of hip hop. And then there's also the Universal Hip Hop Museum, which is working on their virtual exhibit. Um, they currently have a small exhibit before they open officially. And so there's so many structures, institutions, that were typically not for us, right? And we all, those of us who know, know what us means, um, that are really centering this work, right? And they're making sure the people who are doing the archiving work, the curation are from the community, right? Not outsiders looking in, right? Saying, well, who do we wanna highlight and elevate? But it's really those who are there from the beginning um, who are part of these conversations. And so I think we're definitely seeing the 50th anniversary pushing institutions to really center the work and bring us in, um, in, in spaces we normally aren't and to make those decisions. And so I think that's really beautiful. And I would love to see that even more in the K-12 space and the university space. Thank you. Our final question, it's gonna be a, a, a quick whip around as I look at the time we have left. Um, the question asks, each of you employ methods that are critical and perhaps not so mainstream. Did you expand your methodological repertoires outside of your graduate coursework or were you trained as critical methodologists? Any recommendations that you may have for current graduate students who are inspired by your work? Really quickly, I'll say that as part of my um, PhD, I had the opportunity to take a year long class on ethnography, documentary and research that was co-taught mm -hmm. by three professors, one from anthropology, one from ed education and a documentarian. And that whole year was spent just thinking about how we go about doing research, what counts as research and how do we represent that research and, and, and how do you theorize through film, through images, through art. And so I think from the beginning, I was invited into a space of constantly questioning methods and research and representation. So while I never dabbled in anthropoesia before, I think that I've, I've always been thinking about that in the back of my mind and has been like really important in how I think of myself as a scholar. And, and like Danny pointed out, just like in the analysis process of um, thinking about, you know, all the data that I have and like, how do I, how do I do work? That does good work, right? Um, but but I think for me it was that. And in terms of recommendations, I would say read, 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 read. There's so much out there that is really, really inspiring. And read across, read interdisciplinarily. And and you never know. I mean, th there's so much out there that I take inspiration from that really helps develop my own work. I'll jump in. Same thing. Read. <laughs> um, I think to answer both questions that we have, uh, my my research has always been driven. My methodologies have been driven by the questions. Someone said that earlier. I can't remember if it was um, Dr. Williams or Dr. Pato, but the questions have to drive what you're doing um, more so than what are the methods people have used, because you have to find the methods that work to answer the questions you're answering and to do to engage in humanizing research, right, which oftentimes some of the historical ways of doing research don't do that. Um, so your communities and your commitments, as Dr. Williams said, have to be driving the methods um, and theory. And so I I remember when I read Robin D.G. Kelly's book, the whole book, that some people just quote the titles and act like they read the book. Y'all y'all have seen that. Um, but I remember I got to the chapter about art, right, and understanding how surrealism sort of drove um, revolutionary struggles in the Caribbean. And I was like, this makes sense to me. And that I've been driven by that theory in that chapter. Um, that was years ago that I read it. And so my methods and, and my theories really draw from doing the reading. And you you know when that North Star hits you, when it when it resonates. Um, and that's sort of what drives me is the reading and the questions and the community. Read. <laughs> read, mm -hmm. read broadly interdisciplinarily the program that I went through at the time I went through it they did not believe in requirements so we had to take one method methodology class and then it was basically go read go find the methodologies and questions and you know um topics that you care about and communities that you care about so it was it was a lot of reading um a question that a committee member asked me though that really kind of, you know, with re reading decolonizing methodologies by Linda Tawari Smith, and then having this question posed of, who are you to do this work? Why do you get to do this work? Why don't you focus on your own people and let me worry about mine? Um, 
these were questions, these are questions, um, I think developing answers to those questions through my research and through the way I live and, and show up in the academy are really formed, I guess, my North Stars and like continue to kind of push me to, you know, to show up um, in alignment. And I guess I'll wrap things up by saying again, to read <laughs> and to read some more. <laughs> And I would also add, you know, don't be discouraged if you're not getting exposure necessarily to these things in your coursework, because there's only so much stuff that people can cover, quite honestly, mm -hmm. and people cover things that align with their expertise. But I would also uh, I would also offer that you should think about your graduate training as the first step in that intellectual development process. And so um, I'm saying read as a graduate student, but I'm also saying that because as faculty, we do a lot of reading, like the learning never stops. So this is just the first step in a longer academic journey. Thank you all. I'm gonna share this screen again um, for folks who, weren't, who may have joined later to um, scan our QR code to make sure you sign in for this event. But I just wanna end and, and thank you all for your, your the work that you are doing, the work that you've inspired uh, us to think about. Um, you have um, encouraged many of us here to, to think about our work differently and um, our paths differently, to think about how we humanize differently. And um, I'm grateful for you all being here with us in community at UC Davis um, in the School of Education. So again, I hope you can hear, imagine the, the, the applause that you would have had if we were here all together in person. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us who um, tuned in and we appreciate you again for, for tuning into this